welcome to the Coaching Uncovered podcast. My name is Brent Davis and I'm the host of the podcast and this is my podcast where I, where I get to talk to coaches about coaching and we're going down a slightly different path today. Um, it is golf. It is tied into golf. It's not quite uh, pure golf coaching that we're talking, the person we're talking to today, but we've got Jared Pilgrim on the line to come in and have a chat to us today. Thanks for coming in, Jared. No worries. Thanks for having me. I think this will be a really cool conversation, but for people that don't know who you are, can you give us a bit of a background on who you are and what you do? Yep. Um, so my name is Jared Pilgrim, um, 30-year-old from Melbourne. Um, I'm currently on a joint appointment with Golf Australia and Victoria University. So at Golf Australia, I oversee the research and data analytics space. Um, and at Vic Uni, I'm also working on a golf project with Brisbane-based Fusion Sport. So we're developing an athlete management system specifically for golf that we're currently working at rolling out nationally to, to GA. Okay, so that's that sounds sounds that sounds pretty cool. I think we can we can dig into that some of that research, but um, I'm curious um, about your golf background. Do you do you play, and what what handicap do you play off, and where do you play? Uh, I don't have an active handicap at the moment. Um, I play every now and again. Uh, I try to get out a few times a year. Obviously tricky with COVID at the moment, but yeah, um, when I can, I you know try to have a game. I used to play a lot as a um, as an amateur. So when I was younger, I did a lot of the elite development squads. Um, so I, I was a very keen golfer and played sort of club pennant, but, um, you know, as I got busier, sort of fell away a little bit, but still a pretty keen golfer when I can. Okay. So why the, when you started doing your research and your study, did it have a golf twist to it? Um, I guess I've always been, you know, passionate about golf. Um, family's been a really strong golfing family. So I suppose I, I started with more of an exercise focus when I got into, so I did an undergraduate degree in, in sports science at, at Deakin University and I sort of wanted to go more down the um, clinical side and, and particularly go into like a physio type role, um, but with a sport focus, always been really interested in high performance sport. So then there you know, was an opportunity to get involved with golf and being a fairly keen golfer and someone had a, you know, a golfing background, I thought it was a good fit and yeah, just been loving it ever since. Okay, so and yeah, there's a there's a tie in with Scotty, who's a regular guest on the show. So Scotty was, um, I had I had you on my hit list to to talk to at some stage, but Scotty pushed me down this path a little bit earlier because I think we might get you on and do some of those other shows that I do just with him talking about different things. And so I thought we'd do the um, the interview style show first to find so we can find out more about you and then we can get you involved in those conversations with Scotty. Um, we get sick of you and Scotty's uh, voice all the time. We had to clear him out every now and again. Um, so you did some stuff early with the PGA. You presented um, a webinar to the golf coaches out there. Yep. What was that topic about and can you talk me through that? Um, that was a a few years ago now, but if I remember correctly, I think we were looking at developing a system to evaluate talent in golf. Um, so I, I suppose ever since I've been involved with Golf Australia, um, something that really interested me was the value of data um, and how we can use data to make better decisions and also on the flip side to improve athletes' performance. So um, that's always been something that's a real passion of mine. Um, so I guess the movie Moneyball is like a, a really good example that I always go with with people and they say, what do you actually do? Um, and I say, well, that's sort of that, but sort of down that route, but in golf. Um, so, I mean, golf's a perfect sport for data. It's a really data-saturated sport. If you really wanted to, you can collect thousands of data points per round um, and really get granular with it, how you use the data and also what data you can collect. So I suppose I saw really early on that there was um, a lot of opportunity in golf, but maybe just not... Um, at the time, a real central repository of information in Australian golf. So data on players that we know have come through the system and are really high performing. We didn't really have a, a clear idea or a clear stockpile of, of their data so we could really um, draw some clear conclusions on, on what makes them special and what makes them world-class. So I think with that project, I mean, we're talking about some of the early ideas that we had around um, 
bringing in different data sources and trying to, I guess, quantify elite golf, which is a really hard thing to do. But um, I think sport in general is moving more towards like a data-driven environment. So I think you know, there's a lot of opportunities in golf to, to catch up in that space. That that talent ID stuff in golf has its own set of challenges, I think, doesn't it? It's um, I know doing my, my post-grad when I was trying to set up talent ID program for an assessment, um, it, it's challenging to, to find – common criteria across across some of the really good golfers. Yes, they all have good ball flight and they all c- control their golf ball really well, but physical characteristics that those golfers have, there's not too many across the board that are that are consistent. It isn't like a an AFL type training camp where you can go and put an AFL combine and say, well I have to be this tall and run this fast and do this and do that. They don't kind of have that have have that in golf. So how did you deal with those kind of challenges? Uh yeah, it's a really good point. Um and I'm coming from more of an AFL background. I sort of worked a little bit in TAC Cup straight out of my degree. So obviously there's like you said, the draft combine is is fairly set in stone. So there's a clear idea of what good is, uh, which makes it a little bit more difficult in golf. But I think talking more towards the physical side of things in golf, there's definitely more of a, I mean, when I was you know growing up, seeing some of the golfers then, I mean, probably less physically inclined than they are now. And there's definitely a drive now that golf's becoming a really, I mean, you know, people like Scotty involved. Um, there's a real strength in the um, sort of the service provision to more towards strength and conditioning. I think that's a, the game's becoming more about, I mean, it's obviously you can, there's a lot of ways to, to play well in golf, but um, a lot of golfers are becoming more athletic. And I think in the sport in general is um, as it becomes more professional, golfers are being viewed as true athletes. So I think um, it's a tough one for talent ID because it's difficult to say you need to be able to swing this fast or hit the ball this far. Um, But I think there's, I wouldn't say we found a point that's, you know, like the bare minimum, but I think there's definitely correlations there. So, um, yeah, I would, I, I would, I would tend to think the same thing. There, there's, there's probably they, 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 they probably don't have to hit it over a certain over say two seventy yards, for example, but yeah. it would certainly help their game. And I think there is a cutoff point. I think they they have to hit it over a certain distance to be able to be competitive on tour. I think these days. Yeah, and I think as well if. Um, if you're, you know, committed and you want to, you know, in your in your passion and I guess career goal is to become a a highly ranked professional, then I think you, know, you, you sort of owe it to yourself to take yourself serious as an athlete and train like an athlete. And I think that's where golf's heading now. So even if it's only a one percent difference, all that training and um, athleticism that it'll get you, I think at the end of the day, it's you know that that makes a difference sometimes. So I think that's where the, where the game's heading. Okay, well, I've just taken a note down here that we need to get you back on with Scotty and me to talk about talent ID. I think we can do a full episode on that one. So I think we can explore that a bit deeper and talk about um, some of the, the golf coaching things because I part of the part of that assignment that I did on talent ID is I had a section in there for the coach's uh, gut feel, so to speak. So yeah. still that, that coach of of the person or the, that type of golfer standing in front of you did play some sort of role in that talent ID process in that golf space um, where possibly doesn't so much in other sports. Yeah, I mean, I think that's going back to the um, the webinar that we, um, that we ran with the PGA going a while back now. I think what we talked about then, it just sort of formed a lot of the systems we're using now, but we, early, even early on, we were talking about it, sort of a weighted system um, for looking at a, at a player and evaluating them, and more than half of that like evaluation in a weighted system would be towards, you know, like a coach's sort of subjective or subjective or, or expert knowledge. So, you know, which is a big thing in golf because, I mean, I can look at all the data I want, but I'm never going to be able to identify a swing as well as a like a really experienced coach. So there's a you know a big part of that in golf that, you know, maybe isn't as significant in other sports. Yeah, but I would, I would again, I would tend to think that we are heading down the right path with being able to quantify this stuff as opposed to just going purely on feel as a as a golf coach. Um, just in that coaching space in general, we're being, being able to quantify more stuff with regards to swing technique and stuff like that these days, um, and having that stuff in in that in that other other spaces as well, being able to quantify it, I think is is a hugely powerful tool as a coach to have. 
Yeah, I, I agree. The, I think the next challenge is going to be trying to find a way to um, to bring together all that data and into a usable format because, you know, you could collect a million variables on um, from a biomechanic perspective and then there's obviously, you know, your TrackMan data and launch monitor data. It's just, it almost becomes endless. Um, so, and I think, you know, it's, yeah, that's, that's going to be part of the puzzle. Um, and I'm keen to head down that path of uh, the qualities of a of an actual good coach. So just to throw that on top of the mix as well. So you can have all the information about the player, but you still have to have that high quality coach actually coaching that that, that athlete as well. So um, just to add something else to the to the to the puzzle, also. Yeah, and that's that's a whole other <laughs> that's a whole other PhD, I think, Brent. <laughs> there is. Well, that's where I'm, I'm keen to go with my own PhD. If I ever if I ever get to that stage where I start to do it, um, that's where I, I, I'm keen to go. So where did your research go after that talent ID step? Did you head down a different path after that? Um, yeah. So we sort of moved away from um, trying to be too prescriptive about talent ID. Um, I suppose the, the big focus for us after that, um, so we sort of moved into a, a larger program of research and we called it the, um, the developmental DNA of elite golfers. So and I guess that's it's a pretty good, it's fairly descriptive of what the project's about. Really, I mean, it's a long-term project, but we're trying to piece together lots of different research and, you know, build a body of work and really understand what are the building blocks of, of elite golfers. Um, and, and I suppose that's partially talent ID, but it's also um, for, you know, sport organizations, it's important to um, understand what players they should be investing in potentially when there's only a limited amount of funding available. So um, I guess the space we're looking at now is more, well, I guess over the last couple of years, it's predominantly been ranking trajectory. So um, there's been a lot of work in tennis as a sport around sort of looking at players' rankings, quantifying that um, and seeing like just basic stuff around how long does it take players to reach X milestone in golf, uh, sorry, in tennis. Um, and also can we use some of that data because there's a lot of rankings data out there if you pull it all together, use some of that information to predict um, and forecast where a player is going to be in, um, you know, in X years or in a certain amount of years based on their early parts of their career. So I think we've really like um, in some ways mimicked the Tennis Australia approach and we're, we're sort of going down the route of looking at rankings information to, um, to not only benchmark players but also benchmark our program as well and see how you know, Australian golf is going um, and what metrics are really important for, I guess, evaluating our program. So players reaching certain milestones, um, where, are the, um, where are the real challenges for transition for Australian golfers and then using that to inform, I guess, our practice. It's, um, it, it would be challenging for Australian golfers, I think, to if, you, if we're going down that pathway of going on world rankings because they don't have – the access that possibly they had in the past to big tournaments to play in in Australia. Um, obviously, the Australian Tour is not as big as what it has been, I'm talking 20, 30, 40 years ago. Um, but having access to those tournaments is going to have an impact on how high they can climb those rankings. So that how is GA on how, how are you um, compensating for that little bit of a problem maybe for the, for the players coming through? Yeah, that's that's a really great point, and that's um, I suppose the the drive for our most recent um, sort of direction in, in in our research. We're trying to, um, well, we're just about to publish a paper at the moment that we've been working on for a little while now. Um, I suppose early in the game we were looking at um, ranking trajectories, and we, we were comparing Australia to you know the US and, and to European players, which was, as he said, flawed in a couple of ways. One being that you know there's we don't have access to tours and we have to travel to the U S our players need to at, at a high cost. And obviously there's things around, you know, um, just resilience and um, being away from home and on tour, that's a lot trickier for our players. So uh, we've been using data that's, well, we've been looking at data that's both specific to our region. So we're trying to develop pathways that are Australia specific or Australasia specific pathways. So we can sort of better understand and benchmark our players, so sort of an apples to apples comparison rather than um, just comparing everyone to everyone, which as we know, one size fits all approach are generally always a little bit wrong. So yeah, just trying to get a bit more specific. It, it would be a challenging space because there could be a kid that, when I say kid, I say, I say a 
22-year-old golf pro who's got some talent but has got some financial cash behind him, whether maybe his parents have got cash or he's got a sponsor early on in his career and he's got that that cash to go to the States or to go overseas and play tournaments and maybe get access to those sort of events earlier and might build the skills quicker, whereas someone who doesn't have that financial backing behind them is possibly the better player. So it would be a challenging space to be able to identify the right players to support, I suppose. It's a, it's a, it's a strange one. It's a, it's a tough one. Yeah, it, it is really tricky. I mean, and that's why I sort of, I suppose the early, I mean, it's tricky because you, you don't want to identify too far down the pathway. Um, generally, they're closer to um, like a, a program objectives, which is, you know, as Golf Australia, so our but a KPI at the moment is producing top 100 players. So if we can identify closer to that, it's going to be more accurate generally. Um, and we know that, and that's the same in most sports. But at the, at, like on, on the flip side, um, you know, like you said, there might be a really talented player who's turned professional a little bit early, and you know, it does have financial limitations. So I suppose in that um, in that circumstance or in that instance, you know, I, I would hope that they'd be recognised you know, talent ID and then potentially picked up in, in one of our um, like targeted funding. So it's like the rookie squad or one of those programs that where we can like help the player get started and then, you know, fund them into their, into their professional career. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a hard space I think to be involved with. I, I think I'll have to hit up one of your colleagues at GA to come have a chat to me. I want to get Brad on the podcast to come and have a talk to me. See if I can get him. Yeah, I'll leave that question for Brad after I. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's it. I will. Um, I'll have to get him on and have a have a chat to him about that because it's a it's a it's a tough space to be involved with. I, I certainly don't don't envy you. Um, so the research into tournament preparation, you've published some some papers on on that topic as well out there. So, can you talk me through what piqued the interest in that space or is this, is this tied into the same title? Is, was this a starting point for the stuff that you're doing now or does it go off on a separate, separate tangent or? Um, yeah, completely different to what we're doing now. Um, I suppose the interest in that was, um, yeah, just I guess generally looking at having a bit of an understanding of, you know, sort of exercise science and looking at it more from a, um, a training perspective. Uh, one of the questions I always had was how, um, or just general interest, like how um, how seriously do, do, do players take, do, even at an elite amateur level, how seriously do players take preparation or competition preparation going into a tournament? Because um, in you know, obviously, more team based sports, there's a lot of that goes into sort of nutrition, um, you know, travel management, um, or even sleep is analysed fairly closely, and there's been a lot of research, but there really hadn't been much research at all into golf. Uh, and golf, and to me, that's it's just a, a massive gap in the literature because you know I think golfers are more than any more than any, probably any other athlete um, are putting their bodies under quite a lot um, on tour. Potentially, they're never at one hundred percent, and they're and they're you know they're they're playing sometimes a lot of tournaments in a row, and then sometimes you know fairly infrequently. So I think I saw a gap there, and then there was a real interest at the time from Golf Stray to go down that route. So that's sort of the how that came about. Okay, so talk me through some of the findings that you found when you 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 did that research. Um, so, yeah, I guess it's it's spread across um, four papers. So there was um, there was a bit um, in the first sort of couple of studies. What we were really trying to achieve was to just get a really good understanding of what what's a good in tournament preparation in golf. So what are all the different um, elements, uh, be it you know nutrition or um, preparation of course strategy, a practice plan, and, and there was a lot of things. And, it, and, it, and there was more in golf probably than any other sport I'd seen from the from the um, I guess from the scientific research. So yeah, early on we spoke to a lot of coaches, spoke to a lot of golfers just to get an idea of of what's good. Um, and then from there, similar to Scotty, actually we ran a Delphi. Um, so a Delphi is a, a multi round survey with an expert panel. Um, and what you're trying to achieve from it is to build consensus. So you want to you want to get agreement on a particular topic, um, and that's sort of a, I guess, a gold standard measure for, or at least a starting point for for more research in a lot of fields. Um, so yeah, we ran a Delphi study with a, with 36 coaches, um, high performance staff, players, and, and academics from all over the world, 
Um, and then we put together this framework. So there was 46 items um, or behaviors in total. Um, so, yeah, I, I think um, the most important were, um, number one was actually course mapping. So developing a, um, going into the tournament with a game plan or a strategy for the course, be that, you know, jumping on Google Maps and just measuring out things and getting an idea of what the course looks like or even just going through, you know, like a pre-made yardage book. Um, that was the most important thing across all levels of player. So from early amateur to, you know, a seasoned professional, that was, um, it was rated the most highly by the expert panel. And then I think the next one was looking at, um, it was logistics. So it was like, you know, just being organized going into tournaments. That was a massive one, which I, more, more so for younger players than, than more experienced, which is what I didn't expect that at all. But I suppose um, not being prepared can have a significant impact on just stress levels and you don't really want to be panicking trying to get a taxi on the way to a tournament in the morning. So that was something that probably most players wouldn't think about, but it was a you know really important one, um, especially when traveling. Um, and then after that, the next big thing was pre-round preparation. So um, before round, having a, um, a set of behaviors that you can go through that's like really get you into, um, I wouldn't say the zone, but at least in the, in the right space of mind to be, to be able to play at um, you know, sort of your peak. So whether that be stretching, you know, dynamic warm-ups are all the rage at the moment, and then you know, maybe spending some time on the range. But it was different for all different uh, – there's a lot of different recommendations thrown out there, but I think the key message was there needs to be something that's consistent and done before every round. Um, and then the other big thing was, was mental preparation. So it, it didn't need to be consistent. Again, it was just having, um, I think the word toolkit was used a lot, having like a toolkit of, of different strategies that um, the player can draw on. So if, if they are feeling particularly stressed between rounds, they can then um, sort of reflect, recognize that, and then be able to um, use those strategies when need be. Um, yeah. Cool. I don't know if you want me to keep going. There's there's two more studies. So, <laughs> well, let's. I'd, I'd, I'm keen to touch on a couple of points that you brought up in 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 that part there, and we can get back to those last couple of studies as well. But yep. um, a thing that I found when I was coaching in Taiwan is the players over there, and these were high performance athletes, high performance kids. They didn't have any idea how to do a pre round plan. Did you find that in Australia as well? So these these guys um, were this panel of experts has put this up at the top of the tree. Were the, the players on the same page? Were the players doing this stuff prior to their tournaments? You know, it's it's, it's an interesting question because for the first study, we did interviews with amateurs. So I've got a, I got a fairly good idea. Uh, I mean, that was this was years ago. So the amateurs that have transitioned since then and then the ones that haven't, some of the players were were really good and really systematic and, and probably more and more so than you think they would be at a you know, relatively young age. But... Others were, um, you know, sort of not as um, – didn't really have a system in place at all. So I think anecdotally, I haven't really looked at the numbers, but anecdotally I could probably say that the players I spoke to from memory, um, some of the ones that have done really well in Australian golf were probably more systematic with their approach um, and, and they had a real system in place even as amateurs. So yeah. that's an interesting – I wouldn't say a stat, but, yeah, <laughs> just an insight – it was it was just crazy. Like I I was over there and this was two thousand and eight ish. So again a fair while ago. But these players didn't do any of that sort of planning prior to tournaments. I brought that into the training program and they would play practice rounds prior to the event and they're just playing to the golf hole and they're playing as if it was a round of a tournament. Well, guys, we're supposed to be spending time on the greens. Where the pin is today, the hole isn't going to be there during the tournament. So let's go and find the little coloured uh, spots on the greens that's going to tell us the place where the flag is going to be and let's hit some putts to those places as opposed to where the hole is today. Um, and they just didn't have that those systems in place. But it was, yeah, it was quite, quite interesting. And then the... Logistics, you said as well. That was something we spoke about with the Taiwanese team as well. Is okay. How are you going to do it? Um, you have to know how long it's going to take you to get from the hotel to the golf course. How's the transportation being set up? Do you have to find it yourself? Is there is there courtesy cars? Is there any sort of transportation? And then what are you going to do if you get stuck in traffic and you turn up ten minutes prior to your tea time? 
you got to have a secondary plan as well. So that was something that we brought in with the Taiwanese players. And again, did these these players have these these systems in place? Did they have that sort of planning, or was it something you had to force upon them sometimes? Um, yeah, it was very case to case basis. So some of them, I mean, the players I spoke to, some of them did have it in place, and then others didn't. Um, and as I said before, I think anecdotally, the players that have done better seem to have systems in place and be really systematic with their approach, whereas others have sort of, you know, not really transitioned as well. So, yeah, I mean, I think I would say it's important. Um, we found it was important. Um, and I'd be, yeah, I really think it's important that players look at it if they're not already. Yeah, and just being, being planned and, and being set up and being organised for – hydration problems, all that kind of stuff on the golf course. We had this chat with Scotty a couple of shows ago about um, the Taiwanese kids. I couldn't get them to hydrate highly enough and they just weren't planned to do that. They just didn't do it. It was it was, it was very frustrating as a coach. Is that a cultural thing, do you think? I, don't, I honestly do not know. Um, I And I was dealing with a female team at the time as well, so I had to be a little bit – because I'm putting them on scales as well. So you, you've got to be careful with that in the female coaching environment anyway. Yeah. Um, but I was trying to prove to them that they were getting dehydrated when they were playing and they had to drink more water on the golf course. And it was it was a challenge. And they're from a hot country. You would think they would be across that kind of stuff, but they, they really, really weren't. Um, yeah. I think we determined at one stage a couple of the girls were losing – Three or four kilos during a round of golf. It was just, it was just crazy how much they were, they were, they were dropping off as they were playing. So, and that was, and they were still drinking two or three bottles out there as well. So it, it, it just showed how far off the actual um, levels that they had to be that they that they actually were. It was a, it was a real challenge from a coaching perspective. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's having a, I mean, all that's what we know from the science that has a massive effect on decision making. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of different things that are important for on the course. I mean, if it's something that's very controllable, I think it should be like it's a no brainer to to have a system there and, and plan for that. Exactly, it was it was challenging times. So, talk me through the second part of that as you're going through. You said you had a couple more uh, papers that you did. Can you talk me through those ones? Yeah. Um, so the next once we you know had it somewhat of an understanding what, you know, what was important in the time preparation. The next sort of step was to then try and validate the framework. So we wanted to know, um, even though we spoke to, you know, players and coaches and, and academics and we had, an, I guess, what we thought was a good idea of what's important in time preparation, we still wanted to know whether or not it was related directly to performance, So, which was really tricky to do and probably a little bit too much for one PhD. But um, we ended up just looking at relationships between um, – players performing different behaviors in tournament preparation and their well ranking, which was a, something easy for us to, to measure again. So, um, yeah, we used some different techniques and um, we looked at whether or not we could sort of explain or predict world ranking based on what behaviors they're doing, preparing for a tournament, but also between rounds as well. Um, and we actually, yeah, we did find some, some fairly strong relationships. So um, most of the behaviors that were really um, explained ranking to a high degree were, were self-regulatory uh, behaviors. So related to planning, self-monitoring, um, reflection and evaluation, um, you know, these were, these were sort of the behaviors that were really strongly predictive, um, which was interesting because that's, you know, sort of what we know from other sports as well. There's been a, like a fair bit done in um, uh, soccer in particular around self-regulation and looking at its relationship with performance and, yeah, there's some strong correlations there, and, and that was sort of part of the focus of this, this PhD as well. It's um, it's it's. I've always found it challenging in that golf, um, golf setup to get the players to self reflect after an event, um, or even after a round. They're very much after the coach to tell them what was good, what was bad, and they end up very heavily focused on the score as opposed to what they did and didn't do good on the golf course. Because um, as, as golfers are out there that are tuning into the podcast, they're, you're sure they've, you've had those uh, tournaments where you've felt like you've prepared well, your pre-shot routines were good, shots were good, the just the putts just didn't drop or the shots just didn't go quite where they were supposed to go and the score isn't as good as you were supposed to have been. And 
who can all make perfect swings and still hit bad shots. So that's a, that's a challenge as, as a golf coach. I've, I've had a problem with, with my players and getting them to go over their rounds after 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 tournaments. Is that something that's come up in with the GA squad players or are they pretty good at that stuff? No, it, it is a challenge. Um, and I think part of that uh, solution to that is sort of giving them um, like a really easy way to do that. So um, I think introducing those sort of systems of self um, evaluation or reflection early on is important as well. So sort of getting used to, um, I don't really common one is like good bet how system. So, you know, three things you did well during the round, one thing you could do better, and then a little bit of a plan for how to improve for next time. So um, that's something we've really tried to build into um, some of the, you know, the, the, uh, the different um, data collection and data entry forms that we've used with our um, athlete management system. So, I mean, having it in, like everyone's got a smartphone now and, you know, most of these athletes are on their phone a lot of the time um, for better or worse. So, I mean, having an app that they can just enter data into um, straight after a round and not having to, you know, I know a lot of players used to carry around diaries and that sort of thing, which is really tough when you're traveling a lot. So I think having that, you know, access to an, an ability to enter information that their coach can see immediately as well, even if they're not in the same country is, is massive. So, yeah, that's sort of our approach to attacking that problem, which is, yeah, it's a big one. I used to like them to fill out a paper-based form and it was obviously I was traveling in a squad-based situation where I had the athletes with me and I was handling all the paperwork. Um, yeah. But I like to get them to fill it in on paper because then if it was a bad day and it didn't work, they could just tear it up and throw it away. <laughs> so great way to, okay, that round's finished. We're going to throw that away and we're going to start again. So I used to have a, a pre-round planning sheet and a post-round sheet. So they used to, if they had a bad day, they'd fill the post-round sheet in and my little cue for them was to tear it up. It's gone, it's finished, and then we now we'll do the pre-round sheet for the, the round coming up. And that was yeah. how I used to used to deal with it from a coaching perspective, but it, it, it can be challenging. It, it, it can be tough out there. So you said there was you've um, there was some there was obviously holes in that research from a from a golf perspective, but there was some team sports stuff that did this stuff really well. Can you talk about the t- t- differences you saw in team sports as opposed to golf being an individual sport um, around competition preparation? Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess what I saw from, so we did it like initially did it like sort of a, a desktop review of all the literature out there. Um, and, and a lot of the, you know, like a lot of the research was coming out of team sports, like, um, you know, American sports. Um, it was a lot in AFL. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I mean, I'd like to say that those sports are doing really well. I don't really know. I, I think from what I've heard, you know, there are, just because there's a lot of staff traveling with the team, there's a lot more, um, you know, there's a lot more expectations around the player in those areas. Um, But part of the reason there's so much research is because they're well-funded sports and there's a lot of interest from the sports science community just in them. So, I mean, and also a lot of access to athletes, a lot of the time with sleep studies, with um, tracking players, with diary studies where they're looking at um, what, what players are doing for preparation for competition and are they actually doing certain things access to you know the, the participants or the the athletes is a, a lot of the time part of the reason why there's so much research in some things and not in others like golf um so yeah i mean i, I would say from what i've heard that a lot of team sports like even afl are doing things pretty well in that area um but i think a part of that is because they have the resources to do it um, if you've got a nutritionist traveling with you telling you what to do all the time, you're probably going to do it. <laughs> yes, true, true. Um, I'd, I'd be curious and I'm keen to get some other other sport coaches on this podcast. So if there's anyone tuning into the podcast that has contacts in that AFL world or any other sports like that, I'm keen to get some coaches on from those sports. So I would love to have a have a chat to you at some stage. But from a, again, just to pique my interest as a, from a coaching perspective, I would think there would be a lot easier to personalize that type of information in a golf setting because you've got the one player or worst case scenarios, you've got a squad and you've got four or five players, maybe six in a state team um, type setup. But if you've got 20 or 30 AFL footballers 
that have all got different personalities, all got different needs and wants and setups. That would be a tough thing to handle from a coaching perspective, I would think. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, and I think you're right. I mean, I think in, in golf, it logically, it would be a lot easier to personalize. Um, I suppose it, it's it's possible that, you know, in sports like AFL or, or other team sports that, you know, there is a less personalized approach. And, and I suppose potentially that's because there's, you know, more similarities between athletes and there is in other sports where, as we know, AFL is a very physical sport, golf skill based. So there's a lot of different ways to do things in golf. So maybe that that's part of it too. Um, but I think it's, it also just comes down to in golf, there's a lot of the time, unless you're a really high level professional, you don't have a team traveling with you. So that's why it's so tough. Yeah. And we discussed this in the, um, we're, uh, taping this episode on Wednesday night and the podcast that came out today with Matt Jager, we had actually had a chat about this e- exact topic is how did you cope out, out on tour if you, if, with you, if your coach couldn't travel with you and did you were you keen to have your coach out there all the time or were you keen to do it by yourself? So we had this, this whole conversation. So you can scroll back a few shows, everyone, and you can check out the one with, with Mr. Jager and he can talk you through this exact topic. Um, so, yeah, so again, in that team-based environment, it would almost be like, okay, you do it. This is the way we're going to do it. And if you don't like it, go somewhere else. And that, that might be how it kind of turns out some of the players. And you probably you hear stories of players that playing for a certain team that don't click with the coach and go somewhere else and turn into superstars. It can be... Um, it could just be that that strat- the, the coaching strategies are slightly t- different in different spaces, and it's click t- for that person. Yep, yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, yeah, working in yeah, as I said earlier, like AFL TSE Cup for for a little bit. Um, it was very one size fits all, and you know, it's our way or, or the highway a little bit. So, um, and I think that's you know just a cultural thing, and I think generally the golf is a. Um, yeah, there's more attention paid to, like you said earlier, individual differences. So it's it's a very different environment, golf to, to team sports like AFL, a lot different. Yeah. And even from that cultural perspective, I know I had issues in China and Taiwan when I was coaching over there with trying to convince parents and key stakeholders that they could personalize the training a little bit. They didn't have to have the guys doing the same thing for 10 hours a day. They could actually, if they didn't feel up to it today they could actually have a break for half a day and that isn't going to be the end of the world for them so that was that was a challenge as well trying to break that cultural stereotype over there as well challenging challenging so let me dive back even deeper into your research um there's a paper that i read a long time ago um about the role of a caddy in the golf space can you talk me through a what piqued your interest in that space and what did you find um, well, yeah, that was a, <laughs> an interesting one. So, I mean, it wasn't initially something that was really interesting to me. It was more that um, I, I wanted to, at that point, do research in golf and um, it was something that Golf Stray was, was interested in exploring and um, there was really no research into it at all. Um, it, was, it was a couple of studies but very few papers, and which I thought was, yeah, so more from a, I guess, looking at it from an academic perspective point of view it was interesting to me that there'd been like it's a really i think a girlfriend a caddy is a really interesting relationship um and it's probably the only relationship like that in any other any sport uh that i know of so i think that was really interesting for me so i wanted to explore that further and, and get a better understanding of at an amateur level um because you see like people like steve, steve williams on, on tv uh with, with tiger and you know other big players um and you, you can sort of understand He's being paid a lot of money, so it's very professional. But at an amateur level, um, players don't have financial resources really, generally. So, I mean, how does that? Like, is there? A, obviously, they they can they can have a caddy in tournaments, but are they? Do they regularly have caddies? Does that help their performance? Yeah, questions like that. I thought was I thought it was interesting um, to try to delve into that a little bit. Yeah, for sure. So, what did you find when you went down that rabbit hole? Um, what we found, it was, yeah, it was a lot of inconsistency. So I suppose, um, as you probably imagine as a golf coach, and I think you'd know this, that you know, a lot of the time players are being caddied by their, um, you know, they'll have their, their mum or dad on the bag or. That's all bad. That's all bad. <laughs> yeah. And that was one side of the coin. So that was, I guess, examples of 
sometimes what not to do. Um, and there's a lot of, it's just a, it's a bit of an interesting relationship there. Um, and I don't, yeah, I, I, yeah, I can understand why it would be. Um, and I think that was, yeah, um, we, we got a clear idea that at times that probably, I mean, it was just a qualitative study. So we did interviews and sort of explore what players thought. But I, I think we got the feeling that generally it might be better not to have a caddy at all sometimes than, well, than working with someone who <laughs> might create, I guess, more stress and issues on the course. But on the flip side, um, if the players, you know, were working with a good caddy and some of them had a you know, really, really cool experiences with, with good caddies, they actually, you know, can do a lot and potentially influence performance in, in, a, in a big way. So um, that was also a, you know, a really interesting takeaway as well. No, that's um, that is pretty cool, and uh, I, I certainly get where you're coming from when it comes to parents being involved on on the caddy bag. It was um, it's, <laughs> it was uh, when we took the Taiwanese team over to the states to play junior tournaments. It was there was a whole lot of rules set up for the parents. They can't walk, they can't come off the cart path, they can't talk to players at certain times, and I think some of those rules might be um, brought into Australian tournaments sometimes as well. I think it's probably a good thing. Yeah, I think, yeah, coming from this study, it would be a good thing. <laughs> yeah. So, and again, just having that support person, having the right person on the as the caddy would be a huge part, especially as a player improves, um, just to have that right person saying the right things at the right times, I think would be, would be pretty cool. It would be a pretty cool study to go even a bit further and see what it comes up with. Yeah, there's been um, a few papers since um, way back when, when I published that one. Um, it, it was interesting. I mean, it's obviously something that's really hard to quantify how exactly, how much do they affect performance. But I think it really, what it came down to, um, you're testing my memory a little bit, but I think <laughs> the, the crux of it was um, the relationship was, you know, the main thing, which is probably what you would imagine. And I'm sure it's the same with the coach and the player that um, if they had a good, um, you know, back and forth and um, it wasn't always just about golf. A lot of the time they're just talking about, anything and that was enough to like sort of to, to um have an effect on the player you know between shots and sort of get their mind off golf a little bit and break up break up the game um but then the other side of things was the, i guess what players kept coming back to was um i suppose the um the confirmation side of things so a lot of the time you know they'd be humming and hurrying about what club to play or you know what to do in a particular situation and the caddy would sort of um support their decision and help them commit um, and, you know, the, by committing, that sort of was something the players, they all kept saying the same thing. They keep coming back to that. That really helped me, like, um, you know, it, it filled me with confidence when someone else sort of, can, you know, affirmed my decision. So that was something that they didn't even really need to be right or <laughs> as long as they just went straight with the player and, um, you know, they really, I guess, prepared them for the shot. That was that was something that was, was huge. Makes sense. Makes sense. Um, so... We spoke quickly earlier at the start of the podcast about your role with Golf Australia at the moment. So what is the, the formal title of your, your role there? Uh, so, uh, head of Research and, and Data Analytics. Okay, so it sounds a very technical term. <laughs> Talk me through exactly what that role is and what are some of the things that you're doing down there at, at GA? Um, yeah, I think probably less technical than you think. I think the reason for that, <laughs> for that role is that it's you know it's bits and pieces of, of different things, which is which is why a lot of the time these roles exist. Um, but yeah, I, I guess from a research point of view, um, you know, overseeing the predominantly the you know developmental DNA of elite golfers, which is a, the big project we're working on at the moment. But then um, also a lot of the um, a lot of the the work that we're doing, looking at you know the data to sort of inform our decision making around what players should we be funding and sort of taking a really objective approach or, or a more objective approach um, in, in that space. Um, but also like developing pathways and, and getting a really good understanding of, as I said before, what, how does our Australian players pathway differ to someone from who was, you know, born in the U S and goes to college and, you know, develops by that very common pathway for, for a U.S. player. Um, you know, is that different and should our players be going to college and answering those types of questions? And then um, I suppose, yeah, the, the data analytics point of of it is is sort of more bringing in, um, you know, looking at the data, but also, um, you know, developing and and administrating our athlete development, uh, sorry, athlete management system, and um, being able to use that data to, I mean, you'd be surprised how much information if you start if you if you give a hundred people a, an app and you start asking them to collect data or offer them the opportunity to collect data, you start getting a lot of data coming in pretty quick and. 
you know, there's a lot of insights you can draw from from that level of, uh, of information, but it's just knowing how to um, pull the pieces together. So that's sort of like my, my job in a nutshell. Um, but yes, yeah, it's, it's a lot of different things day to day. Now, just on that collection of information, I'm sure there's players out there that are really good at doing it, but I'm sure there's players out there that you just tear your hair out that don't fill it in. How do you deal with those guys that don't fill it in? Um, yeah, it's hundred percent the case. I mean, and I think it's always going to be that way that some players are more inclined to like, they love like the stats and they love tracking everything. There's always going to be some people that don't like that. And I think, we're trying to, you know, look at it from from that sort of approach. Like, there's certain things that we want players to record that we think is really beneficial. That, you know, even from a self regulation point of view, like if you're getting in the habit of recording information and, and sort of self reflecting and self evaluating, that's like information's great. But also, you know, the skill set that you're building that players probably don't know they're building is really important as well. So there's certain things we want them to do, but then there's other things sort of more optional. It's like if you want to record everything that you do in a day, you can, you don't have to, but you know, you might, I mean, we're trying to use that to, you know, develop different um, insights and sort of show them more about their training and their performance. So you can learn a lot, but you, if you don't want to, you, you don't necessarily have to. Um, yeah, I think I, I had similar challenges with the Taiwanese players. I was doing it old school via Excel spreadsheets. We didn't have access to phone apps back in the day. So they were filling in Excel spreadsheets and sending it off to me um, every week or so. And my my little little con job on them was, okay, I want the data, but you, you don't need to read it. You need to give me the information, but I just need to be able to, so I can – tweak your training if we need to or make changes to what's going on, but you, you don't need to read it yourself personally. So it's probably easier on a phone. They can just key it in and turn the phone off and it's done. It's gone. It's off to someone else's problem then. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting one. I mean, we, we sort of found that um, – so early on, you know, I spoke to all the players and sort of asked them what they want from this sort of system and they, like, they'd used them in the past. It's sort of the opposite to the Taiwanese players. They said, uh, actually, we, we – if we put data in, we want to see it. Like we want to know what it's doing. And we're like, we don't want to just put information into some endless void. <laughs> Which I thought was very funny. And then, um, you know, I guess for me, it makes sense. Like I've got a, you know, I'm really into the wearables and, you know, data on training. So I'd want to see as well. So I think that's fair enough. And that's sort of, we're trying to, you know, give them information and as in, in an easily digestible format. So yeah, that's been something that's, that's really important for us. Which is so easy to do these days. We had a chat with Scotty about the Whoop band, and again, we both stressed that we weren't being paid by Whoop at the time. But um, um, yeah, we had a chat about how easy it is for the athletes these days to be able to see how good their quality of sleep was and how that kind of stuff. I was testing stuff like resting heart rate because we didn't have access to that type of technology back in two thousand and eight. So it was a bit of, a little bit more old school type type setup. But that's um. It is. It is so easy. And again, I think any any golfer that's trying to improve is going to want access to the information. But you've got to be careful sometimes from a coaching perspective that they don't dive in too deep by themselves. They need to be guided by the coach and by the by the support staff, so they're going down the right path as opposed to just going full on detail. Yeah. It. it yeah. It's almost. It's a bit of a. It's a bit of a rabbit hole. Um, but yeah, I, I agree with the wearables. I mean, I think. Like I've got my Whoop band on right now. <laughs> Again, no plug. I'm not getting <laughs> fortunately. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it's like I think really that's the future. And as we've sh- we've seen, um, I don't know if you, I didn't listen to that podcast, but I don't know if you spoke about um, how they're using the you know the Whoops for a sort of COVID symptom tracking in golf at the moment um, on all the big tours. Like that's it's massive, and I, I think it's really paving the way, which has been one of the positives sort of for if there is any positives out of COVID, it's been sort of how we can sort of change practice and adapt really in an agile way. And I think that, you know, the, the wearables are, are going to be a massive thing moving forward. Mm, that's really cool. Well, Jared, thank you so much for coming in tonight and having a chat to me. I certainly appreciate your, your time. Um, it's flown by. Um, so I think I might have to hit you up at some stage to come in with me and Scotty and be the statistical guy to talk through me just talking – Airy fairy coaching stuff and Scotty talking esports science stuff, and you can throw the a statistical slant on it as well. I think that'll be a, a pretty cool three way conversation. Yeah, sure, happy to do it. Um, so, yeah, thanks for having me. It's been fun.
I'll get you in for there. But we have a far, series of fast four questions we ask everybody of the podcast. So I'm going to throw those questions at you to finish off tonight. Yep. So the first question is, and you can come at it from a sports scientist point of view if you like, but any advice for someone getting started in your field? Um, I suppose just try to find out what you're, what you're passionate about. So, you know, doing a lot of different things. Um, if I'm coming from a yeah, sports science point of view, I'd say, you know, get involved in the training side of things, daily training environment with athletes, um, you know, working as part of the support team. And then also, on the, you know, sort of my side of things, which is looking more at the, the training data and information and plugging numbers in, in a room. Um, you know, if that's what you like doing, it's, you know, it's still both are really valuable contributions. And then from there, I'd say go and, connect with people in industry, just speak to as many people as you can, see what their day-to-day looks like and, yeah, go from there. So should they be targeting in gaps or should they be targeting on what they're keen on doing themselves? Um, well, I mean, if I, if I was going to, you know, give advice to someone if they said what's the what's the gap gap at the moment, I mean, it's probably, I wouldn't say it's too late, but um, sport analytics is, you know, it's a really growing field. I mean, in Australia alone, there's there's master's courses now, postgraduate courses in, in sport analytics. That's that's all new. That's the last, like, when I finished my degree, that didn't exist. So, um, you know, things are changing really quick. So that's a massive gap. But at the same time, things like if you don't like math and you don't like stats and you don't know, like dealing with data, <laughs> you're not going to like sport analytics. So, yeah, that's another thing to think about. No, that's cool. Um, okay, advice for golfers that are out there, so or could be sports people in general. So coming from it from your with your sports science background, so advice for for sports people out there, what should they be doing to improve themselves? I'd say, I mean, probably coming at it, I guess it's applicable to any sport. I mean, I particularly golf. I'd say just you know first thing, play lots of golf. Um, um, you know, I'm not a golf coach, but I just from a from a data point of view, I just say you know start collecting as much good quality data as you can on your strengths and you know and your weaknesses. Um, and then I, I know that's a really easy trap to fall into in golf. Is that you know you, everyone focuses on buying the latest piece of technology or a newest putter? Um, <laughs> I've done it myself, but yeah, I think really like focus on collecting really good data and information and having a clear idea of what you're good at and where you're losing shots. And if you can understand that, then that's information that your coach will really be able to you know, work with you on. Um, and then having a plan is, you know, even a bad plan is worse than having no plan at all. So, yeah. I would I tend to agree. And it's so easy these days to get that data. There's so many stats apps out there these days. You can just key it in as you're on your phone as you're playing and you can get that information really simply these days. So I'd certainly reinforce that, that advice. That's good advice. Yeah, I mean, I, we could do a whole podcast on, on on wearables in golf, but yeah, golf fitted sensors are you know, very cool, very cool tech, and you can collect a lot of data and not have to do much. Oh, that's pretty cool. Um, anything that you would change in your career up until now? Obviously, you're still a young man. You still uh, haven't hit your peak yet, I'm sure. Um, anything you would change? Because I know I would change heaps of stuff. And I, I say this every time I ask this question, I would change heaps of stuff in my own career, but is there anything that you would do differently in your career up until now? Yeah, it's a tough one. Um, it's still, yeah, I think relatively early into my career, I hope. Um, and, I, and I've had a good run and I think, you know, I've had a lot of really good opportunities, so I'm really grateful um, for where I am now. But I suppose the only thing would be I, I straight out of school, I, I didn't go into sports science. I, I was training to be a pilot initially. So, um, and I, I sort of found out that wasn't for me. So, a little bit of a time sink there, but I learned some lessons. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's probably the only thing I could, if, it, if I had gone straight into my current career, I could be a little bit more ahead, but, you know. So, it's, a pilot, talk me through that. What was the idea behind being a pilot? Oh, I just, you know, it's something I, I was always really interested in, um, sort of airlines and commercial piloting. So, yeah, I did a course in commercial aviation and sort of, so yeah, you know, I got my I got my pilot's license, but you know, sort of cut it off there. Um, didn't go any further with it. So, okay, cool. Yeah, cool. Okay, so where do you see your area of expertise heading towards? So five years time, where do you see this space being at? Um, I think I really think we're on the edge of like a you know a big breakthrough in. I guess particularly my space at the moment, and it's you know exciting times for golf. I think I think there's a real you know the data evolution going on, and 
I mean, it's it's sort of already started in sport, but I think in golf, um, you know, with all the the accuracy of wearables is um, is increasing all the time now. Um, there's really good information, like you said about the whoop band, sleep hygiene, recovery metrics, just by wearing like a you know little band on your arm. It's it's pretty amazing what you can do now. And then as I said earlier, club fitted sensors are getting really popular. Um, you know, one of the products, Arcos, which is you know, really cool. You just put these sensors in your club, get all this really good information. Um, it's sort of, I guess it's almost like shot link for, for amateurs. So, um, yeah, I think there's a lot of really cool stuff happening in this area. It's an exciting time to be working with, with data. Um, so, yeah, hopefully I'll be allowed to keep working in this space for as long as possible and doing some cool stuff. Be on the cutting edge and building your own stuff out there, so we can we can keep keep moving forward in this space. Pretty cool. So, where can people find you if they would like to discuss more with you? Chat? Are you on social media? Have you got a website? How can they get in touch with you? Um, I I'm on Twitter, but I'm not very active. So <laughs> maybe that's something I need to work on <laughs> if I'm going to be more into podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> So I'll I'll put a, a, a your Twitter handle in there. I think I, I checked again today because I followed you from the the coaching pod podcast, um, the coaching uncovered podcast Twitter account, and I think you might have last tweeted in two thousand and eighteen. So that might be a bit of a <laughs> that might be a bit of a bit of an issue. So um, probably the best thing is where can people find your research? Where was it published? What journals? Um, yeah, a little bit of a mismatch. So there's um, International Journal of um, Sports Science and Coaching was the, was the caddy research. Um, um, and then the European Journal of Sports Science, there's one in there. Um, some of our Gulf Street research is in um, same sort of sports science journals. Um, Google is the best thing for finding research. You know, it's just type in role of the caddy. It'll come up 100%. <laughs> um, but yeah, I looking at sort of providing some type of space that can present all this information because, you know, it, it'll be good to set something like that up. Um, I will put some links in the show notes for that one. Um, and you're part of Scotty's Facebook group, aren't you, as well? So Yeah. So you can hit hit him up there for any questions as well. So again, you've heard the uh, golf performance science it's called, isn't it? I think I can't remember. I should know. Scotty said it to me every time he's on the on the show. Yeah, did, um, yes, that sounds right. Yeah, golf performance science or something. So, but it's brought up in the other shows I do with Scotty. So you can find it on Facebook. Ask to be put into the group, and we can share some ideas on there. So um, I'll put a link to that page in the show notes as well so thanks jared thank you so much for your time not i appreciate you coming in having a chat to me it was a really awesome uh chat and some really pretty cool information so we'll definitely get you back on soon to expand on where your research is going great thanks for having me brent